don't trust my own desire for there to be a God, my own desire for there to be someone waiting for me when I die. I want that too much to trust making the choice to believe that. I need to see evidence. I got to stick my finger in his side. We aspire to become awakened beings, to live in harmony with the truth of life. From Vast Noodle Media, I'm Trent Bell. This is Knowing and Believing, a podcast about how we believe. So, to give you an idea of what we're going to do here on this podcast, we will be having conversations with hopefully very interesting people who can illuminate the experience of deconstruction with their story or expertise. Now, faith deconstruction, if that is a term you're not familiar with, is not necessarily losing all belief and becoming a nihilistic atheist, but it is a process of taking a hard look at the puzzle you've put together, often called your worldview. This whole worldview thing affects us way more than at least I ever really understood. You know how sometimes you see people with yellow tinted glasses and think, good grief, how can they see things correctly? Well, we are each experiencing life with those colored glasses of a worldview, and it can seriously distort and deceive us as well. So, I am attempting to understand my own worldview, attempting to try and get a read on its specific color and possible distortions that could be totally misleading me. And this process can be very unnerving like this morning at 2.38 a.m. I eventually just gave up trying to sleep and went for a walk in the moonlight on the beach in March in Maine at 3 a.m. It was a little cold, but I had a good walk in the moonlight, did some yelling at God, and, you know, that was nice to vent a little. Um, If there's anyone staying in the beach houses, they might have thought they were about to die at the hands of a crazy man, but whatever. So, an important distinction in this podcast will be a focus on how we believe rather than what we believe. Because how you believe leads to what you believe. I think belief comes through subjective means, which means I must interpret my subjective life experience through my worldview to then form beliefs about the things I cannot objectively know. So yeah, the system of how is really important because it can distort the end result. Interesting to me, I have found the most meaningful parts of life are actually subjective, not objective. And we certainly don't need to get together each week to sing about the objective truths to keep feeling close to them. Understanding this has forced me to admit there is no objective evidence of God. So, as I reassess and retune my process of belief with conversations on this podcast, hopefully it will land me closer to truth. Essentially, what we are talking about here is epistemology, which studies the nature of knowledge, justification, and the rationality of belief. But you can't call a podcast the epistemological podcast because no one would click on it. So to let you know who I am, so you're not just listening to some crazy fool, which after this you might have that opinion. But anyways, uh, as I said before, I'm Trent Bell. I am a commercial photographer and filmmaker. Um, I am married with two kids. Uh, Personality-wise, to let you know the kind of person I am, (laughs) I'm a person that needs to work on themselves a lot. And by that, I mean work on my character and personality a lot because I can be very uh, self-focused, introverted, introspective, uh, and melancholy and cleric. So I can be very self-centered and very determined about it. (laughs) Um, As far as shortcomings, I've got so many shortcomings, but I think the best thing you can do with shortcomings is be honest about them. And uh, yeah, I'm very naturally self-centered I have to 
consciously think about taking care of other people rather than just seeing like, oh, they look okay. I'll continue to think about myself. That's That would be my normal MO. And yeah, I, I did that for the first 10 years of, of my marriage and that didn't go well. And finally my lovely wife had enough and she said, we need to talk about this and get you on an improvement program. And so we got me on an improvement program and we'll st- we're still married to this day. Poor, poor girl. Uh, my background. Yeah. So I grew up as a Seventh-day Adventist. My dad was actually a Seventh-day Adventist minister. And I grew up in the church. That's basically all I knew. I was never really part of any other community uh, until getting out of university. So all the way through grade school, high school, university, everything within a very insulated Seventh-day Adventist environment. Um, And admittedly, the Seventh-day Adventist environment can go from liberal to very conservative. My experience um, seems like it's been more in on the conservative end where I would actually describe my parents as being a little more on the liberal end of that. So, I don't know. Um, had a good childhood. I uh, felt that my parents loved and believed in me and all that. So, I, I don't think I'm approaching belief uh, with any chips on my shoulder from real like serious shortcomings from my parents or my childhood or like terrible people in the church that you know anything like that I have I don't have anything major that's happened in my life that's really twisted my perception in a in a negative way towards belief I just eventually came to a point of uh, having a philosophically a hard time with it So the short story of my deconstruction, um, interestingly, about uh, two days ago, I was going through uh, the old voice memos on my phone and uh, came across a song. Before we had kids, I used to write music and record it and stuff. Um, But once you have kids, your life gets very busy and you have to whittle down what you actually do. And uh, I was going through voicemails that I had recorded, just voice memos that I had recorded, and one of the songs was about the difference between actually knowing and believing. And that was over 10 years ago. So easily a decade ago, uh, I really started to admit to myself that I had some real issues with this and started lightly searching, I would say. And then over the past three years I've much more publicly um, and vocally questioned and taken it very seriously as far as um, admitting the doubts I had and directly confronting those doubts both personally and publicly. Um, the The major things that really were unseating me uh, as far as towing a uh, traditional Seventh-day Adventist line of belief, you could say. Um, You know, the issue of homosexuality. uh, It felt very strange for me to be a heterosexual in a church that rejected homosexuality, or they would say at least the practice of homosexuality, without really consulting, you know, people that had grown up that way, uh, that, that had grown up gay you know that we just kind of I remember early on in my childhood everyone kind of assumed that being gay was a choice and then everyone started to realize that you know this isn't a choice this is who these people are and the answers I was getting from the Semptay Adventist community for me were very much the first thing that I just couldn't justify with the individuals that I knew that were gay I, I didn't know how a loving God could allow them to be born that way and then say tough toenails you just have to be celibate and alone the rest of your life I just that didn't add up so there was cognitive dissonance there that was um, just too much of a conflict that really started to uh, you know bleed onto other parts of of my belief that like didn't add up and, and it wasn't something that I could just take and 
put on a back shelf and ignore. There's also the realization like, well, what if someone's born a hermaphrodite? At, at that point, does the church then say, well, you can't find companionship with anyone because you're in the middle? Or does the church say, well, you can choose? Or does the church say, then we'll choose for you? What it tells me at that point is that the choice lies with the person. And sometimes the, they might be smack dab in the middle and able to go both ways. And if there is a God, I, I don't think when they're born that way with that amount of ambiguity that we've seen documented throughout history and medically and everything else, there's just, it's not a black and white issue. It is, a, it is an open conversation. It's a, you know, it's a hue of sexuality going on there that I just can't theologically or philosophically uh, cast that kind of judgment on people at all in any way, shape, or form anymore. I can only say I accept you and find companionship and, and find your way of having peace. That's, that's the best thing you can do, honestly. So anyways, I'll ramble if I don't keep on track here. Um, yeah, then we had the whole thing of evolution. That's a, you know, literal six day creation uh, is very far fetched from what we can objectively see. But as soon as you introduce a God into the picture, um, nothing's far fetched if he's all powerful. So he could conceivably create a planet that looks like it's billions of years old at a point in time. Sure, but that makes no sense. Why would God do something like that? So, you know, evolution was another one that just kind of started to unseat me. Um, then there's also a thing like, why do we refer to God as having a penis? Why do we always say he? And to me, that pushes back on religion and uh, the Bible and everything else being very much a cultural document that is steeped in a patriarchal society, which is not really uh, fair. Which then, what about the women in leadership thing? Why don't we allow women to be in roles of leadership in, in a lot of conservative spiritual congregations? So that was another thing to me that was like, yeah, strike five. <laughs> um, and then the odd ones that were peculiar to Adventism were things like uh, end time events, time of trouble, the Sunday law, thinking that everyone was going to come and get us. And then the more heady issues of things like free will, not to mention the problem of evil. If there's an all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good God, then there shouldn't be evil. But as we know, evil does exist, so therefore there is not an all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good God. That's a logical conclusion, but it eliminates the possibility of God. This is an age-old argument with a lot of different answers, but none that I have found objectively convincing. And I would argue that I was part of a fundamental-ish religion that took their beliefs objectively in many ways. That, now, that's just my opinion of my experience, my personal experience in that religion. And I do hope to have some guests on from my previous religion that could maybe steer me straight on that. Another thing that was difficult for me was the realization that most every religion thinks they have it right. They all believe like, oh, we got it, we found it, we can now have certainty and move on. But only one of them can have it all right. And that's just, it seems so arrogant and it, it just seemed like human emotion and psychology playing a lot of games and creating systems that ultimately deliver comfort and hope. And for far too long, I was feeling like I was choosing comfort and hope, personal comfort and hope, and staying there while ignoring people that were outside of what that personal comfort and hope brought me. So the danger there is that, you know, if you were born gay in a, um, a religious culture like Seventh-day Adventism, you would grow up knowing that who you are is outside of the culturally accepted norms of your closest circle of 
you know, love, influence, and relationship. And that's such a detrimental, deeply disturbing thing and only contributes to, uh, you know, higher levels of suicide within that population. Another thing that was that is and was and still is really difficult for me is why doesn't God reveal itself at all? Like when I go out to the couch in the morning and sit and try and pray and meditate for a bit, why doesn't God just sit down next to me for a minute and say, hey, what's up? Pat on the back. Thanks for trying. <laughs> Let's talk about the, you know, whatever. It, there's none of that. There's nothing. Like people claim spiritual experiences and I respect that they've had an experience, but I'm, I'm getting nothing here. And why can't God do that? Well, the answers revolve around, you know, a uh, justification of God's character by allowing evil to run its course. And then, well, if God did reveal himself, then you'd lose free will because you wouldn't be able to choose uh, what to do in the face of the all-knowing. You, you'd just be overpowered and only be able to go the way of the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good gods, therefore losing free will. But at the same time, some Christians believe that there is no free will, that we are predestined and all that. And, and there's just such complex answers to these fairly simple um, contradictions that I just... I'd, I'd really much rather hold all of this in far more of an open hand, which my previous religion really didn't allow me to do. They had an answer for everything. So, yeah. Now, as far as deconstruction that I've gone through, uh, like, what are the pain points of really going through an experience of deconstruction? Um, this type of thing can be extremely difficult Personally, if you come from a religion that's very cultural and very conservative and tight-knit, like Seventh-day Adventism, uh, if you're going through it only on your own and you have a spouse that's still in that uh, religious belief system, it can be extremely difficult for that spouse and for you, and it will be extremely difficult on your marriage. Luckily, I am still married and my wife still puts up with me, even with the deconstruction and being a crummy husband for the first decade of our lives. Um, she's, she's pretty long suffering, so that's great. Um, but it, it is very difficult on her, I know. Another thing that's really difficult about this process is, is letting your family down. You know, not just your wife, but then like your parents and your children. Uh, your in-laws, uh, all of that is really difficult when your whole family comes from that similar background. I know what my family expected of me and wanted of me, and I, and I know what my wife thought she was married and hoped would have for a husband and a father for her children. I know what my mom and dad uh, hoped for me, and I know my my father-in-law has to have wanted to wring my neck a couple times. There's a lot of appreciation there for all of my family being very respectful of the whole process, even though I know it has probably been very difficult for them. Um, but it is personally very difficult to sit and watch. Like, uh, my brother-in-laws are the nicest guys you will ever run into. I don't know that I've, you know, I don't know that I know more conscientious uh ethical, moral, you know, kind, gentle people than them. And uh, it, it's kind of hard at times to, you know, watch them lead out in a family worship or, or whatever and know I'm, I'm not going to be fulfilling that role anymore. And I know that is letting down people in my closest circle and discouraging to them. And I know my kids see a disconnect between what I'm going through and what they see other people doing uh, within our family. And that's emotionally difficult. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't know what to do with that, but the thing I do know is I don't think that uh, belief is a choice. That there doesn't really come a point where you just say, all right, I'm going to not for me anyways it, it's not 
Um, I don't trust my own desire for there to be a God, my own desire for there to be someone waiting for me when I die. I want that too much to trust making the choice to believe that. I need to see evidence. I got to stick my finger in his side. Now, that's an interesting thing to me that that is in the Bible, that the Bible accommodates materialists in some way. It's just interesting, but I'll leave that there. <laughs> um, so the danger in, in the experience of deconstruction, uh, you know, divorce, uh, breaking your family up, it's, it's a real issue if you come from a, a, a tight-knit, very cultural religion the main concern is like, well, if I go through this, you know, my wife might leave me. If you're if you're Mormon and as a man you go through losing that specific faith in their belief system, I believe the the woman is then unable to go to the next uh, you know level because she's attached to a man. And then if your man's like, I'm out of here, she's like, oh great, you know. So that's that's a danger. Um, not as much that belief thing, but you know the actual you know breaking a family up because of this. Another danger is your consciousness ending forever. If it ends up being true that there is a God and that He's going to be pissed if you don't believe in Him, in that you questioned, and He's going to smite you in the end, and you're not going to be conscious for the all eternity. That's a risk, but it seems a little odd that there would be a God that would be so trite and vindictive to say you didn't have enough evidence just from a book. So yeah, I'm I'm not really worried about that, but it's a gamble. Um, I, I would just think that God would respect that I'm honestly trying to find God while eliminating the things that I think are human additives to uh, the process of belief. Of course, there's always another danger, the burning in hell forever. Um, if you're the type that believes in the burning in hell forever, that's a personal belief that you're going to have to uh, get over before you really do this. And yeah, But I don't actually think that's a danger. But what is my hope out of this? What, is, what do I hope to achieve with this whole podcast? I mean, in all honesty, I hope to have conversations that will help me find God. I want to find God. I want there to be a God. I desperately want there to be a God. I just can't be. I have to be honest with myself, and I can't let myself be deceived by my own emotional biases and my own lies that I know I can tell myself to justify other things. I can easily apply to believing things that will comfort me. So I want to, I want to find God in this process, but I need to do it in a way that I can stand behind. And I could no longer stand behind my previous faith. I did not feel that the the moral consistency was there to be able to do that. I hope to find an ability to understand this experience of consciousness and what it means. And I hope this helps someone in the same way. Thanks again so much for watching this first little episode of me going on by myself here and just explaining what this is going to be and who I am. If you have any questions or want to contribute to this in some way, send us an email, contact us uh, through our website or Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Let us know what you got and tune in for the next episode where I really do hope to get my wife on here to talk about her experience with this because she is still in this religion that I was part of and I am not and that creates a lot of conflict that we have so far been able to navigate with a little tension here and there obviously she's a very intelligent 
very strong-willed, very capable person who stands her ground in every way, shape, and form, and is not one to just take on the beliefs of the person she's married to. It's been an interesting ride and could be uh, a very interesting conversation. So tune in next time. Thanks. Thank you.